Hello, everyone. I'm the Sonoran Desert Grower. This is the first part of the Raising Chickens for Eggs and Meat tutorial slash workshop. So this picture right here is of my beautiful son. He's about, I think he's two or three years old in this picture around there. And we are raising about 50 meat chickens. And I just put together a structure out of pallets and tarps to raise 50 chickens. I made my own feeders and waterers. So I've been doing this for a very long time. My son is now uh, 10 years old. Um, I've been raising chickens for eggs and meat for over a decade. And I've decided to put everything I've learned into a workshop that I can share with the community. I'm making the first part of the workshop available to everyone on YouTube for free, but the rest of the workshop is gonna be exclusive to the Patreon community. You can join my Patreon community at www.patreon.com slash the Sonoran Desert Grower. For as little as $2 a month, you can support my work. I have different levels of membership, which come with uh, more perks, right? But the $2 level gives you a lot of stuff. I self-published my own book, The Dryland Permaculture Growing Guide, and you can access that for as little as $2 a month. So check out the Patreon. There's a link in the description of this video below that will take you right to the Patreon. And subscribe. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's totally free. If you like this video, uh, subscribe, and you can watch the rest of the videos for free. It costs you nothing, and it actually helps support the channel a lot. And just watch a bunch of videos. If you want to support the channel, subscribe and watch a bunch of videos. So yes, let's get into it. So you want to think about raising your chickens through the permaculture framework because it's going to be a lot less work and you can save a lot of money um, to produce eggs, meat, and compost. So let's think about, I broke it up into three categories, the needs of the chicken, the products and the behaviors of chickens, and the intrinsic characteristics of chickens. And let's get into each one. So for the needs, the things that they absolutely need are shelter, grit, they need dust, water, air, food, and they need other chickens. So for here in the dry lands in the Sonoran Desert, the shelter needs to be open because uh, it's so hot here they need it to have an open uh shelter so you don't want it to be super enclosed like you don't want to build it out of plywood always have um like wire walls uh grit is so that they can crush up their feed um so oyster shells i personally crush up their eggshells and feed it back to them so that's how they, that's their main source of grit in our flock. Dust, they clean themselves with dust baths. So our chickens do that in the compost um, and they love digging in the compost and covering themselves with the compost. And this is when it's, you know, almost done. Um, they also have access to a run that we've put sand in so that they can get their little dust bath action going on but you want to you want to give them uh for example my mother-in-law we built her a six by four chicken coop and we we added a shallow uh storage tote with sand so they could take dust baths it's very important uh, obviously they need water they need um, good airflow because it's so hot here they need good quality food and they're social. So you need at least three chickens. That's like the minimum number. You need at least three chickens. They're social um, little animals. Um, the more chickens you get, uh, they have a hierarchy. 
Um, and we'll, we'll kind of get into that with the products and behaviors. So the products and behaviors, obviously eggs and meat are the biggest products for our, for us as humans, right? They also produce feathers, manure, um, methane, CO2. They scratch, they forage. If you don't clip the wings, they can fly. They can scale a six foot wall, no problem. And they fight, they're territorial, they pack. And as I was saying before, if you have a lot of chickens, there's a hierarchy. There's always going to be a top hen and a low, low hen. So I think a good number is like about a dozen chickens. That would be a good number because you could eat some. You could keep some as pets for the eggs. Usually the egg-laying egg chickens end up, end up becoming pets because you have them for a couple of years. Okay. So the intrinsic characteristics. So th this is going to change depending on the breed. So the color, uh, their climate tolerance, and this is very important for us because we're in the dry land. So we need, we need to focus on uh, breeds that are heat tolerant or in general, very hardy breeds. Those, you know, will do better here. And then there's breed specific behavior. So for example, in my family, we pretty much have dialed it down to two breeds that we like to invest in. So we like to get the Easter Egger chickens, which are kind of like a hybrid, like mutt type of chicken. But they love to dig and they love to work in the compost. And they are prolific egg layers. So those are kind of our egg layers. And... They, they're kind of skinny, so they're not too skinny. They have enough meat on their bodies to make it worth harvesting them when they get old. And one of the biggest pluses is that they have colorful eggs. So we get green and blue eggs, which is nice. And they're very consistent egg layers. The other breed that we like to get are the any variety of the Orpington. Uh, we've been mainly going with the um, the lavender orpingtons, which are kind of pricey, but the kids love them and they're very beautiful. And we only get like eight to a dozen of them. So, and and those are great because they get pretty plump and they get pretty big. So it, it's a nice harvest when it is time to harvest them. So we alternate. Um, every two years between the Easter Eggers and the most recently the Lavender Orpingtons. And they're totally different in terms of their behavior. So the Orpingtons are more chill. They let us pick them up. They're very affectionate and loving. They're like great if, if you're if you have kids, like little kids, because they're not as territorial. But then, you know, with the Easter Eggers, they are kind of territorial. Uh, they're a little bit more wild. They're If they escape the coop, they're not going to just let you pick them up kind of thing. So, uh, but they're great foragers. They, When we put them in our garden, they get in there and get all the weeds and start looking for bugs. So they're a little bit better as kind of workhorses in our garden. And I'm going to get into all that as we go in through our presentation, but I'm going to just drop all kinds of gems on y'all and all, cause, all kinds of knowledge as we go through this workshop. I have, I think, about 19 slides. So, and I'm going to get into detail, into in-depth detail with everything. Okay. So stacking functions. This is a key principle of permaculture and the idea is to do more with less let's look at the relationships between things and set things up in a way where uh, things are feeding into each other and needs are being met by functions in different places in our design so that it creates less work we're, we're doing the most impact with the least amount of labor so in our master site design, 
And I have a full tutorial on how to do a master site design. There's an exclusive tutorial on my Patreon. And I walk you through how to do a master site design. It's one of my older tutorials. So you're gonna have to dig through the Patreon. I have several years worth of tutorials just as in depth and in quality as this. So check it out. But anyway, the in your master site design, you want to make sure that you're stacking the needs of your chickens, uh, for the intrinsic characteristics, their behaviors, and the products into your design. You want to be thinking about all these things as you're designing your site. That way, when you have your chickens in place, everything is going really well. They're being fed. You're getting chicken. You're getting eggs. You're getting meat. You're getting compost. So... In specifics, when we're talking about the chicken coop design, we want to take into consider consideration the natural behaviors of the chickens. So for example, the scratching, the pecking order, um, obviously their food requirements and their water requirements, the ventilation, all these different things, right? And we want to build beneficial relationships between various elements of your overall site design and your chickens. So I'm going to give you a very real world example, because obviously these are just kind of bullet points in our PowerPoint presentation. So real world example would be putting your compost system inside your chicken coop. And I have a, I have a tutorial. And I believe it is free on YouTube now. It used to be a Patreon exclusive, but I'm pretty sure it's free on YouTube where I talk about how I set up my compost system inside my chicken coop. So definitely go and check out that video on YouTube. Uh, but just to recap right here um, in the workshop, um, the what I did is I built a eight by eight chicken coop that way I didn't have to cut down any wood any lumber because you can get them in eight foot pieces right so I just built an eight by eight chicken coop and um, I split that in half so I I did a four by eight long compost system in the back of the chicken coop so it's a two bin system I split it into two bins so I have compost bin number one on the left side and then compost bin number two on the right hand side and I split them right so there's a divider in the middle I put the chicken roost so the roost is the stick that they sleep on at night on um, halfway down the compost piles right so about two feet in that way when the chickens go to bed and they poop all of the poop falls into the compost bins. Now, I don't know if y'all know this, but chickens release 80% of their manure at night. So it's a genius design because it creates less work for me to clean because the poop is going directly into the compost bins. So I just have to be on top of adding mulch to it so that it doesn't stink right and then i just clean the floor about once a month and i stack i stack it into the compost piles we also give them our food scraps they go right into the compost piles it's a very efficient design right so we were thinking about the innate behaviors of the chickens they like to scratch they like to dig they like to forage all of that all of those needs are being met by the compost being inside the chicken coop. They also release 80% of their manure at night. So it's automatically being deposited into the, in the compost piles themselves just by being set up properly. And I have pictures of this stuff um, of my coop and all that. But again, I, I want to refer you to the video that I made. It's about a 20 minute, 20 minute video where I go in depth on my system and it's free on YouTube. But that is a, an example of what I'm talking about here with stacking functions and thinking about the needs of your chickens. And it's just a very um, 
to the point example, right? Like you can visualize it, you can see it, um, and it works. We're producing tons of compost. So the chicken connection, I pulled this off of um, offline. I got this image online and I don't remember where, but I love how it puts all the connections. Um, and this is pretty much what, I was, what I've been talking about so far. So let's kind of go through them. So the house, the food scraps are going to the chickens, right? So we're giving the chickens the food scraps. They're producing food, feathers, and methane for fuel, right? And if you have like a biodigester kind of thing, if you're, if you're that sustainable. So then let's say you have a pond or an aquaponic system. The, the food in terms of fish and plants and I guess water even goes to the chickens, right? The manure to fertilize the plants. Now, I'm not sure about an aquaponic system, about using manure to fertilize the plants, but I know that in pond systems, what they're talking about is if you have a free range chickens and they're near a pond, they're going to go there, drink some water. Um, you might pull out some fish to feed them. Um, and then they're going to poop around the, the pond and fertilize the plants, right? With the nitrogen and all that stuff. So in a free range system, in a more wetland environment, that would be a connection there. So the orchard, the food, uh, so the fruit, the nuts, the insects, it also provides them shelter. And we free we free range our chickens in a controlled manner. So we, cause we have hawks and stuff, but we watch them when we let them roam. And when the fig trees and the pomegranate drop fruit on the ground, we don't pick it up because it's a gray water system. So we'll unleash the chickens and they love it. And they love being in the shelter of the fig tree in particular. And they'll, they'll kind of roost on the branches and stuff. Um, so they really do love uh, fruit trees, being under the canopies of them and cleaning up the the fallen fruit and they de definitely dig for insects and things like that so obviously they're giving us pest control the chickens they're sanitizing the area and they're fertilizing the orchard and this is so true we've had a lot less june bugs since we've let the chickens roam underneath the fruit trees because they eat all the grubs okay so then in the yard pasture uh, they can eat the grass, the worms, insects, they can forage, and they are pretty much um, giving us fertilizer, and they're keeping our, our yard clipped, like the grass, they're keeping it back. And again, I have um, Bermuda grass that just kind of grows everywhere, and we'll let the chickens roam, and they love eating it, and they'll actually go right for it. So... Um, they definitely knock it down. Um, if there's a lot of Bermuda grass in our veggie gardens, we'll do a, a quick pass with the chickens. And um, they usually knock it down for us, and then we can start amending it. Okay, so then let's say you have a greenhouse. Um, it can be used as shelter. It could also produce food for the chickens. The carbon dioxide for, for plants, if you... Let's say that you have your chickens in there during the winter, they're going to produce carbon dioxide for the plants and methane for germination, manure, and heat. So some people do incorporate their chickens into the greenhouse design, especially if they live in an area where it snows. So then let's say you have more of a forest area. They will provide pest control, manure, and fire control. Um, and then you can get food, shelter, and perches from the forest. So they're roost sticks. And let's say you have a garden. You should have a garden. I encourage you to start a garden because your garden can help you feed your chickens. We always give our chickens a portion of our harvest. And it's just the right thing to do. Like the chickens get so sad when they see you pulling out all these delicious veggies and taking them inside. 
you hurt their feelings, you know? So, so I suggest you don't hurt the feelings and you give them a little bit of the food that you harvest. And that's what we do. We always give them a cut from the harvest and they are so happy. And they, they reward us with delicious eggs. Obviously, they're going to create more compost for us. Um, especially when the season is over, we will let them go in there and turn the plants over for us. And they'll definitely spread the mulch and they'll help us um, till it in and harvest the spent plants. So it's a very... Um, helpful relationship and and this diagram really shows why i personally love raising chickens because there's so many benefits to it especially in a permaculture system where we're trying to get to a resilient um status with our with our gardening program and in particular if you are gardening I feel chickens are the key to your success because they're going to help you produce so much compost. It's insane how much compost I'm able to produce with like two dozen chickens. Okay. So now we're going to get into the chicken housing needs. So it needs to be secure and safe from potential predators. It needs to be dry when it rains. We need shade in the summer months because it's just so hot here. Um, we need a roost, a stick for them to sleep on, a nesting box for them to lay eggs in, and room to move around, so floor space. So let's talk a little bit about each one. So the secure and safe from potential predators. This is going to vary depending if you're on the city or in the rural area. So if you're in the city, I suggest that you have a first layer of chicken wire to keep the small birds out from, from eating your feed. So uh, a half inch poultry wire fencing would be the best. It's kind of expensive. So then three quarter inch poultry fencing would be kind of the second best. And that's what I, I typically use, but the half inch will definitely keep the little finch finches out of your coop if, if you have that problem. So then the second layer that I like to use is the welded wire horse fencing. So the kind of like rectangle square fencing. And I, I use a narrow crown staple gun to fasten those in place so that they don't move on me now um that is kind of expensive but i've had a coyote jump into my yard um, they've jumped over my six foot brick wall and ate my entire flock of chickens and i was just left with heads and feet and after that experience, um, I just decided that it's well worth the investment in the in the fencing because it I haven't had any losses since then. And we've had like stray dogs get into the backyard. We've had uh, hawks try to get into the coop. Like they're attacking the, the fencing on the coop, trying to get in there. Um, the same thing with the dogs. The dogs were not able to chew through the horse fencing. So it, it's worth it because if a stray dog does get into your yard, you're going to want that horse fencing on there. And um, another caveat to that is you want to make sure you have a good latch on your door so that if a dog is pressing on it, it can't just break in there. So you want the latch to be good. Um, I actually have, cause I help people do these things in the community. I've built chicken coops for people and help people, um, start their, um, raising chickens journey. Um, and people have lost chickens to raccoons of all things in Tucson. So I guess there's raccoons in, in certain parts of Tucson. Uh, so, 
whenever I build a chicken coop for for people kind of in rural areas or even like by a mountain, even like areas where there's pockets of wilderness, even if it's in the city, um, like if you live by a wash or something like that, I always put a locking mechanism on the nesting box so that if you do have raccoons, they can't open the nesting box and get into your coop and kill all your chickens. Um, I also put the horse fencing on the bottom, on the floor um, of the chicken coop in areas where it's rural or uh, so that coyotes can't dig under there and get to your birds. So I'll do that in rural areas and areas where there's the raccoons as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like what I really focus on for the sick, the sick, the security and safety of the chicken coop and the hens. Um, you want a good roof on it? Always, always use the the metal roofing, like the cheap metal shingle roofing. Um, it works really good. It's like twenty two dollars for an eight foot panel um i use shade cloth on the western side of the chicken coops and sometimes the eastern side it just kind of depends on how the sun is hitting the coop in the summer but i usually staple with a staple gun uh shade cloth if it's necessary you don't want your birds heating up in the summers like they, they can plop over and die um, I like using a natural uh, mesquite branch for my roost. So I will just uh, cut a mesquite branch to the size that I need. And I always use a fresh mesquite branch. So I cut, I'll cut, i cut it fresh and then I'll facet it in there with screws. And it's a little bit harder because it's fresh. But... Um, they last a long time when you do it that way. And I'm looking at about a, at least an inch and a half uh, stick, like in terms of thickness, right? So it needs to be a, about inch and a half in thickness so that you can use it for a roost. Um, so the nesting boxes, uh, I've made them out of five gallon buckets. And I'll show you guys uh, the five-gallon buckets a little bit later on when we get there. But I've made them out of five-gallon buckets. Um, a long time ago, that was my main my main way of making them was five-gallon buckets. But it is so hot here. And, I, you know, especially uh, when we're talking June, July, August, I, I feel bad having them lay eggs in a hot bucket. So I've moved away from that, and now I'm all about a communal nesting box. So I, I like making a huge communal nesting box, and that's because I have, I like, I raise a lot of chickens, so it's nice to have a big one. And it works out. There's a lot less fights. Um, they still end up picking their favorite spots, right? But... um it's pretty easy to build. Um, I'll walk you through how we, we built ours. And um, I also have a, simultaneously as I'm doing this, as I'm recording and editing this workshop, I am recording a how to build a chicken coop tutorial. And I'm gonna walk you through the entire process. I'm gonna show you how I built the nesting box and all that stuff. So everything I'm talking about here, I am showing you how to do it step by step with measurements and everything um, in my how to build a chicken coop tutorial. And it's kind of the same setup. I'm going to have the first part uh, go live on YouTube and then the rest of it is going to be exclusive to the Patreon community because they are supporting this work. They're the ones that are um, supporting me financially every month and there has to be perks for that right so they get the in-depth advanced knowledge so don't get too hung up on 
um I'm trying to understand like all the details and visualize and everything because I have a whole separate video series, tutorial series, where I walk you through the build step by step. And I'll show you how to build this nesting box if if you join the Patreon and you check out the tutorial. And last but not least is the amount of room you give your chickens so the floor space. This is gonna this is super critical, especially for when you get into the higher numbers, because the more chickens you have, the less grumpy, the more grumpy they're gonna be. The less chickens you have, the more happy they're gonna be, because they're they're hierarchical animals and they're also social creatures. So they can get incredibly mean when there's a lot of them. So just kind of keep that in mind. It's always better to have less than more um, in terms of the space that you're working with. So can you free range your chickens in your backyard? <clears throat> so these right here are my lavender Orpingtons and they are helping me knock down this Bermuda grass in one of our gray water basins that we're getting ready to plant. And it's the summer. So we put a bowl of water in here and this beautiful hen is drinking water. And um, this one over here is digging and checking out the grass. And you can tell that they've done a lot of work. They've done a lot of work. <clears throat> so let's talk about how to free range chickens in the backyard. So the term free range, it means that birds are giving access to a space outside of the chicken coop where they can run around. So you can do this in a bunch of different ways. Um, you can fence off an area that they can forage in. And this can be the area that is surrounding your chicken coop. So you have your chicken coop. And then directly outside that area, you have a fenced off area that's kind of like their pen. So this is called a coop and pen design. You can also incorporate runs into your chicken coop, which is what we do. So we have a fenced off passageway that the chickens can forage in. And I like to throw like grass in there and weeds in there to get stuff to, to work on. And that's the area that we kind of added sand to so that they can do their dust baths. And we just threw sand on the ground for them. Um, ours is attached to the chicken coop. It could be a, it could be a separate area, uh, or it could be attached to the coop. Um, other folks just simply fence off their gardens, veg vegetation, patios, things that you don't want your chickens to have access to, and they just let the chickens run around in their yard. We did that for years, and we would lose a couple to hawks while we were at work and whatnot. But when you have a bunch of chickens, you know, it ends up working out, ends up evening out. Um, but we did that for years, but then we kind of wanted to be not feeding hawks all the time. So we, we went with the run. Um, so again, if you let them run around, you're gonna have to fence off everything because they're not gonna respect nothing. They will kill your roses, they will, poop on your concrete all that stuff okay so let's talk about the pecking order and this is going to be the last slide for the youtube and um the rest of this will be exclusive to the patreon but we'll go ahead and get into the pecking order so like i said before chickens are social animals and they have a hierarchical system and this governs their interactions. And there's a top chicken and there's a low chicken. If you have a rooster, they're going to be the top. And then they're going to have a top hen and then the, the low totem pole hen. So again, one hen will always be on the top and one is always going to be on the bottom. And it's always changing, especially if you're harvesting your birds. And... um. I definitely suggest that you harvest the mean ones so you end up with a, a gentle and loving flock. So 
uh, stress factors will bring out this hierarchy and the chickens will definitely hurt each other to cope with the stress. So for example, if they're running low on food, if they're running low on water, they're gonna start to fight with each other. If they are running low on floor space, they're gonna start to fight with each other. If they don't have enough space to roost, if the roosting space is not adequate enough for the amount of chickens you have, they're gonna start to fight. If you have different, um, so a common mistake that I see is when people set up their roost, they have different levels of roost. So they have one roost that is higher than the other. The top chickens are gonna fight for the high position. And then the lower chickens in the totem pole are gonna be relegated to the, to the stick that is lower. So you might not even be realizing that you're creating a power struggle by having um, roosts that are set at different levels in terms of their height. Um, so all these little, they're, they're social animals, there's a hierarchy. So any little thing like that will elicit that response from them. So we have to be very mindful of, of their innate hierarchical nature. Um, chickens are omnivores, but just barely. They lean more towards the carnivore side and they are slightly cannibalistic. So if any chicken exhibits any weakness, um, they might just peck it to death. They might decide as a group to peck it to death. So let's say that a chicken gets, um, this, ha this has happened to me, like a chicken will get stung by a scorpion and they're immobile and then they'll get pecked to death because they can't move. Or a chicken will will cut themselves somehow foraging around the yard and then the other chickens will continuously peck at the blood or the the cut and they'll peck it to death so uh you have to be on the lookout for that i for example one time our chicken got stuck in in uh the one of the pallets that we use to uh, make our compost bin inside the chicken coop. They were digging and they got their legs stuck in there. And we caught, we must've caught it like the day after or something because she was very weak. Uh, it was during the summer and she was obviously um, dehydrated and she was getting pecked on because she was stuck. So we had to take apart the compost uh, bin because she got her foot in there really bad. And we were able to save her. We had to bring her inside and hydrate her and baby her, baby her back to life. But she was about to die on us. And it, it was mostly because she was getting pecked on, right? So she had to, she was bad. She like, uh, she was missing a lot of feathers and they're just very, very mean. Like if, if one of them is hurt, they're going to turn on them and they will eat them. So you have to continuously check on your chickens and we have a whole other um, chicken coop that is that is small. It's about two by eight. And that's where we put the chickens that are getting pecked on. So we have a chicken coop that we can separate chickens if we need to so that they don't get pecked to death. And that um, let, let's say that they get stung by a scorpion. Um, they're getting picked on, bullied. We can separate them. Or we want to harvest some, we can separate them and harvest them the next morning. Okay, the pecking order can be very vicious, especially if we design a coop that doesn't take into consideration their basic needs and floor space requirements. Yes. So the biggest thing we want to we want to be mindful of is not putting too many chickens into the space that we have to work with because we're gonna have a mean flock and a grumpy flock because they're always gonna be fighting with each other. Okay, so I'm gonna, and this is my, my chicken coop design, my world famous compost inside the chicken coop. And I'm gonna just show you guys all these slides here so you guys can see I'm not messing around. And I really put some time into this and it just keeps going. I didn't go all the way. Look, it just keeps going. So if you want to, 
if you want all this in-depth knowledge here, join the Patreon at www.patreon.com slash the Sonoran Desert Grower. And you can have access to the rest of this workshop. I'm going to go in depth. I have videos to um, that I'm going to pull up to get to show visuals of everything and so you can see everything in action as well. And again, I'm going to have a tutorial on how to build your own chicken coop and same setup. The first part is going to be released on YouTube and the the rest of the tutorials are going to be exclusive to the Patreon community because they are supporting me. They're supporting this work and there has to be benefits to being part of the Patreon community. Um, but I am committed to always putting out super good information for free on YouTube and the Patreon community makes that a possibility and a reality, just like this tutorial right here. I hope that you learned something. Um, the egg, egg prices are out of control and I wanna help people uh, take control of their food supply and be self-sufficient and raising chickens is super, super easy and it's very fulfilling and they can do so much for you in your garden, right? So that's kind of the biggest takeaway that I want y'all to, to get from this workshop is that chickens can really take your garden game to the next level. There's nothing like growing uh, food with compost that you made yourself. You're never going to get to like crazy high yields until you start making your own compost. And for me personally, having chickens allows me to produce a ton of compost. So that's one of the main reasons I like to have a bunch of chickens. So again, we've been at this for over a decade. I'm going to share all of my knowledge with y'all. Join the Patreon. If you really enjoyed this video, do me a favor, subscribe to the YouTube channel, watch more of my videos and share them with people that you think can benefit from this knowledge. And that way we're helping people elevate themselves in their gardening journey. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next one. I appreciate all the Patreon folks that support me. Y'all make amazing workshops like this possible. Thank you for the inspiration and lighting that fire in me to, to put this kind of content out there.